I'd like to open the meeting, everyone. The QMS acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. We recognise the continuing connection to lands, waters, fungi and communities. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you everyone for coming. And thank you, Jonathan Plett, for sharing with us. So I trust most of you have read the article and gone, wow, genetic modification. Fungi were doing it long before we were. Um, and how exciting is that? They're so far ahead of us. And that's probably an oversimplification of things. So uh, on that note, I'll hand over to Jonathan Plett, Dr. Jonathan Plett, and I'll allow him to introduce himself and uh, let you know what, what he is doing and um, to share the knowledge he's accumulated today, which is recently published. Yes. Thanks, Jonathan. Welcome aboard. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for all of you for um, attending today. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to share all the accumulated knowledge. Some days it actually feels like it's all fallen out of my head, I must admit. Um, so a little bit of background on me, obviously, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from around here, uh, originally from Canada. That's where I did all of my uh, graduate work, uh, mostly actually looking into plant biology. It wasn't until I moved to France uh, to work with Francis Martin there uh, that I started working with fungi, um, looking into the molecular uh, machinery, I guess you would say, of how um, mycorrhizal fungi work. And so since then, um, I've spent four years in France and then I have been here um, at Western Sydney University uh, for another 10 years. And so um, slowly, slowly, we begin to learn how these mycorrhizal fungi are operating. Uh, and tonight, I just thought I'd give you a couple of vignettes of, of what we've been looking into. So when I talk to people nowadays um, and talk about the fact that oh, I work with with fungi and and fungi that work that interact with plants are like oh I love fungi I I love mushrooms you know there's these red ones you know you know do you work with those red ones and I'm like no no those are ammonita um, don't work with them oh okay then they pause and usually think a little bit more and then they're like well there's these really small cute ones you know that they, they still kind of look the same but they're really tiny. And I'm like, yeah, no, don't look for those ones either. And then they're really confused. And they're like, well, aren't all mushrooms looking the same? And I'm like, well, the ones I work, work with, you know, they're called pisolithus. They usually won't know about what they, they are. And I say, well, they do have a, a common name associated with them and it's the dog food fungus. And that again has them being like, well, why would a mushroom be called dog food? And then I show them pictures like this and they begin to understand. So Pisolithus may not be the most pretty of all the different mushrooms and fungi that you can be um, working with. However, I, I would suggest that it is actually quite a cool one. So hopefully you have the same idea um, by the end of this evening. So as Wayne was saying, you know, fungi have been doing a lot of really cool things for a long time. And that's probably because, you know, they've got a very long um, history of evolution. And so it's estimated, you know, that extant fungi are the result of over 700 million years of, of genetic modification or evolution. Um, and nowadays we would have, you know, what we might term as three main ecological lifestyles. And so you've got the saprophytic, um, which are those uh, fungi that break down dead organisms and return them to their more basic constituents. You have pathogenic fungi that actually kill off plants and animals. Um, and then you have the more mutualistic fungi. So certain lifestyles have arisen many times over the course of evolution. Um, ectomycorrhizal fungi that I'm going to be talking about tonight are, are a really good example. So you can see here from the phylogenetic tree that is on the left of your screen, um, so each one of those little boxes there um, with a small short name um, is a different species of fungi. And then they're color coded based on their ecology. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that you have you know, green, which are ectomycorrhizal fungi, yellow, um, which are those saprotrophs, red, which um, are the parasites. And as you can see, they're kind of all jumbled through there. The colors are jumbled through there. And that's because you know, over time, some of these lifestyles across evolution have shifted a little bit back and forth. 
And so that gives us a bit of a genetic goldmine to try and understand what are the basic building blocks of what makes up a certain lifestyle um, within fungi. Now, as I said, tonight I want to really just focus on ectomycorrhizal fungi. And when, you, when people talk about mycorrhizal fungi, actually usually they're thinking about our buscular mycorrhizal uh, fungi, which are those um, fungi that colonize things like uh, a lot of our crops and things like that. Ectomycorrhizal fungi, on the other hand, colonize roots of trees and shrubs. And yet they do basically the same job as, as those arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. What they do is below ground, they improve the rooting and establishment of these young seedling trees or shrubs. Um, in the longer term, they're touted as, as being good at, at uh, accepting um, carbon from their hosts and sequestering it into stable forms below ground. Um, but above ground for their hosts, they are typically associated with improving the growth of the, of the tree or shrub, uh, the nutrition and or stress tolerance. When we think of how these mycorrhizal fungi are colonizing though, usually what you would see on a foray would be the, the actual macrofungi above ground. However, below ground, they're actually producing even, I would suggest potentially more beautiful structures. And so when they're colonizing a root, um, if you were to take that root and section it, kind of like, you know, if you were to take your finger and section it this way, you would see your bone in the middle, um, you would see the, the flesh around the outside. So if you were to do the same thing with a, a plant or a tree root colonized by an ectomycorrhizal fungi and, and stated this is what it would look like. So this is just a quarter of a root here. Um, any of the red um, outlines that you see, those are plant cells and anything that's stained in green is the ectomycorrhizal fungus. And what you can see is that you have, you know, this massive fungi um, or hyphae that are surrounding the root. And that's what's a structure called the mantle. And it actually seals off the root from the surrounding um, soil. But then you have this, these green fungal hyphae that are going into the roots themselves. And they don't actually penetrate into the cells of the root, but they stay in what's called the apoplastic space. So they, they go in between um, the root cells. And when we, when we say ectomycorrhizal fungi are symbiotic or mutualistically symbiotic, um, this relationship uh, is considered mutual, a mutualism because the fungi produce nutrients um, or provide nutrients for the tree and the tree produces sugar through photosynthesis that it provides in return to the fungus. And that, that nutrient exchange happens here wherever you have a green fungal cell um, encountering the red um, plant cell here. There's um, a connection point and there's an exchange that goes on. So as I said, I work with Pisolithus. It's a nice model system um, to be working with to understand some of the molecular or mechanistic nuts and bolts of how a fungus might take over a tree root. Um, because Pisolithus is known um, at the genus level to colonize a whole bunch of different host trees, you know, from the eucalypts that we're familiar with, um, to Leptospermum down here, um, to pine trees over here. So depending on the species, you'll find different species on different hosts. Now, Pisolithus is a bit of a complex beast to work with because currently there are roughly 19 defined species. Um, of this genus. However, that's usually based on one or two genes. Um, if you look a little bit more in depth at, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 genes and try assembling, you know, a family tree of these guys, um, you begin to see what we would call cryptic speciation, where we have, you know, subgroups within a species that may be the same species, may not be. Um, but we'll stay with the idea that we have 19 defined species across the world. Now these 19 species have quite a broad host range. There are at least um, 50 known hosts uh, at this point. As I said, most of them are trees, some of them are shrubs. Uh, in most cases though, they are actually economically important. So if you think of timber, um, they're colonizing eucalypts. Um, when you're thinking of honey, they're colonizing manuka and kanuka. Um, so these are actually quite important fungi uh, to be looking at. Uh, because of those hosts, they are found globally. Um, this is both naturally 
um, but also due to industry. So because they are so valuable um, as a symbiont of a tree and helping it to grow, uh, the forestry industry has actually been responsible for taking some of these uh, fungi that you would normally find in Australia and spreading them to Brazil, North America, Europe, et cetera, as they move eucalypt around the world. Similarly, as um, pine growers have moved pine around the world from North America, you also begin seeing some of their Paisalitha symbionts from North America that are now being found in the Southern Hemisphere as well. But as I said, um, I am a mechanistic person. I like to know nuts and bolts of how things work. Um, and so we're looking at what is enabling them to actually colonize that root. And so we can think about this um, from a number of different ways. Um, so trees like humans um, have a defense or immune system. Um, so you can imagine just like we and our bodies don't like being taken over by things like COVID um, and we have an immune system that fights that off, plants as well have an immune system that is able to identify um, disease causing fungi um, that will be trying to colonize our tissue. And a lot of cases, um, plant immune system is able to identify a pathogen or a disease causing fungus based on the fact that that fungus is actually really invasive. It's trying to degrade plant tissue. It's trying to grow into plant tissue, et cetera. However, if you remember the fact of, you know, that cross section of a root that I showed earlier, where, you know, you have those green cells, green hyphae penetrating deep within the root, these beneficial mycorrhizal fungi are also very um, invasive within plant tissue. And yet for some reason, the plant is able to um, either turn off its immune system, um, or the fungus is able to overcome it. So the prevailing theory at the moment is the idea actually that mycorrhizal fungi are quite manipulative and that they might you know, overcome the host and actually kind of lull it into a certain form of, of um, quiet um, acceptance of their presence. Another way we can think of this though, is that you know, in order to take over a plant immune system, we can think of the immune system much like we would look at you know, protecting something of value or trying to keep people in, in the case of a, a prison. And the fact that a plant's immune system is like a well-guarded prison. And potentially fungi could be, have evolved a complex series of evasive tactics to avoid certain death. Um, so if you yourself were trying to go through this field of razor wire, you might you know, try and put on some protective gear. You might try and you know, wiggle through where there are fewer sharp points. Or we could, you know, the fungi may have evolved a way of cutting a key um, and slipping in through the side door. Because why would you want to go through the razor wire if you could somehow pick the lock and enter through a side door. So that's what I'm gonna look at today is what are some of these keys um, that fungi have evolved to try and avoid this gnarly kind of um, immune system of the plant. However, trying to identify, you know, what we might consider as a key um, is kind of like some of these games, you know, where you're supposed to find a certain number of things in a very, very messy room. So within a fungus, if you look at a genome and you, if you think of the, the genetic complement of, of, of a simple fungus, they have about 21,000 different genes. That's a rough number, um, 16 to 20,000. And so if you imagine you're looking for one or two simple keys in there, it's actually quite difficult. However, there are different ways that we can go about this. And the first thing is to know where and when to look. And so this is a cartoon here where you can see that, you know, this is pretend soil in behind and you have some hyphae growing towards a root. And we think, um, and current evidence would support this, is that as these hyphae get really close to these roots, much like if you were to see a friend, you know, in a, in a crowd of people, you start talking to them, we think that hyphae start talking with the roots in, in a particular manner. Um, and start trying to communicate and say, hey, I'm here, I'm actually kind of a good person. Um, or if we think of, uh, or good fungus, sorry, not person. Um, or you could think of it as the fact that they're starting to deploy these keys um, and they're starting to use some of these keys and say, oh, can I use this key to unlock the root? Can I use that key to unlock the immunity of the root? Okay, so tonight I'm gonna kind of delve you into the world um, of molecular biology and look at, um, 
two different types of what I would call keys that fungi use. And this would be RNA and proteins. So don't worry, we're, I'm gonna keep it, try and keep it quite light um, for those who have not spent their career in molecular biology. I will try not to go too deep into this, um, but we'll look at kind of a first year biology kind of level. So first we'll start with RNA. And this is ribonucleic acids. Um, I think, especially now that we have had COVID and we've looked at different vaccines and the fact that there are these RNA vaccines, people are beginning to understand a little bit more what RNA actually is. Um, but we'll go over a little bit first of, of what some of the central dogma is about what RNA is and what it does. So every single living um, eukaryotic cell um, and prokaryotic cell has um, what is called DNA. Um, so DNA is the template that codes for all of the different proteins, et cetera, that make up an organism um, and, and are the directions or blueprints for how they operate. However, how these blueprints are actually read is through the production of what's called RNA. So RNA is a copy of, of bits of these DNA um, or genes from within this DNA. And the dogma is that the, the DNA is transcribed or copied into RNA. And then this RNA is used to produce proteins. It's totally true. There's nothing wrong with that idea. However, what we're finding now is that this very simple model that has been taught for years and years and years is actually far more complicated than we ever thought. And one of the interesting um, developments within recent years is the finding that there's, yes, RNA that produces protein. However, there's also these other really tiny bits of RNA, which are called microRNA or miRNA, as you'll see in my slides. And its role is not in translation and it's not to produce a protein, but actually completely opposite. It's to interfere with the production of proteins. Now, within fungi, um, the way this works is this, and I'll lead you through this. So you have, as I said, you have genes which are encoded in DNA. However, there are also these small little bits of RNA, and what they do is they float around in the cell, um, and they have, um, they can be called what's complementary, or they have a mirror image um, that is found within those um, RNA pieces in the cell. And so if you remember, if I go back just briefly here, you can see that um, DNA is what's called double-stranded. Um, RNA is single-stranded. Okay, so it just has one string of bases. And so within a cell, that's usually how you find RNA. So what these little microRNAs do is they bind to those single pieces of RNA and form what's called double-stranded RNA. And the reason this is important within a cell is because evolution has, within eukaryotes, has identified single-stranded, so these just single pieces of RNA, as good. That's what you normally produce. However, double-stranded, so these, these little pieces of RNA that have two strands on them are actually bad. And the reason these are bad and why evolution in cells has identified them as bad is because these are typically only found in viruses. And so when these small little pieces of RNA bind to what's called a target, micro, or a target messenger RNA, they form a double-stranded RNA, the fungal cell starts going, eh, eh, this is bad, this is bad, and it destroys it. And so what these microRNAs are doing is they're actually destroying these copies of DNA that produce proteins. So it's called what's inactivation or cleavage. So that's nice. This happens within a fungal cell. But what was asked a few years ago within the US is this idea of, okay, well, if it happens in a fungus, could these little microRNAs also be a little bit more mobile? And could they actually go into other organisms and really mess with how those other organisms work. And so in this case, they would actually go outside of a fungus into a plant cell where they would bind to plant RNA, create this double-stranded thing. The plant itself would go, crap, bad. This is like a virus, I'm gonna destroy it. And whatever that RNA should have made, whatever protein that should have made, it will inactivate. So the reason I'm telling you all this is because plants, remember, have an immune system and their immune system is based on the activity of proteins. To produce that protein, you need this mRNA here. However, if fungi are producing these microRNAs that interfere with the production of proteins by 
essentially having them destroyed, that would mean the plant would no longer be able to produce a normal immune response. Okay, so that's kind of the background we're going for here. So going back to our Pyzolethus model, we asked the question, could Pyzolethus be making these small RNAs or these micro RNAs? And the answer was yes, we did a lot of uh, genome sequencing. We created boring looking tables like this, but essentially this is just to say that, you know, like other um, disease causing fungi, like other plants, we have found that they are able to produce these really short pieces of RNA that could be something that is used as a key to manipulate a plant, okay? We looked at the expression of these, because remember I said in that cartoon, as the hyphae are growing towards the root, they start communicating with the root by sending out um, these potential signals. So it could be protein, it could be microRNA. But first, in order for it to do that, the fungus has to produce it. And to understand this, we look at the expression um, or production of these microRNAs, and then we plot them in what are called heat maps that look like this. And so this heat map, um, so you have one microRNA here through microRNA 11 from Pyzolethus. And if the boxes here at these different time points of colonization are yellow, that means they're turned, that means that that microRNA is produced. If they're blue, that means that um, the presence of the plant root makes them turn off. So the fact that some of these are yellow would indicate that we have some of these microRNA that only turn on when there's a host present. So that begins to tell us, heck, maybe these are actually involved in some part of that colonization of the root, okay? However, the question, but for them to actually do that, they would have to remember, get out of the fungal cell and get into the plant cell. So the question that we asked is, are any of these actually transferred into the host cell of the root? To do this, we do a lot of our work actually not out in the field because it's very difficult to manipulate things and people get very um, worried if we start bringing out things like genetically modified organisms. So we work a lot in Petri dishes. So very small, reduced, simplistic systems. And our fungi um, can be grown on these um, membranes. And then what we can do is we can put them um, into what we would call presymbiosis or um, indirect contact with the plant. So in this case, um, in this cartoon, you have plant roots and then you're gonna lay that membrane over top of it with the fungus growing on top. And anything that comes out of the fungal hyphae and that can um, get into the roots, it, this is a nice way of seeing if it can cross a membrane and get into a plant root. And what we did again was we took those roots um, that had been physically separated from the fungus, and we then looked to see, could we recover any of these small RNAs that are only encoded by the fungus in the plant tissue? And the answer was yes. Of those 11, we were able to recover four of them that had transferred from the fungus through you know, open space into the plant root itself. One of these we began to look at a little bit further, and this is again looking at microscopic level um, of the root. Up here, um, we have a root that has not been exposed to um, the fungus, and what you have here in purple are the nuclei of every single cell. And down here, we have another root that's been exposed to the fungus, and we have actually labeled or tagged this little piece of RNA with a fluorescent molecule that's kind of a cyan color. So that's the bluish color that you see here in these cells. And so this is really indicating to us that um, these little bits of RNA, even though they're really, really tiny, are getting out of the fungal cell and getting into the plant cell and then they're potentially doing something. So the question is what? What are they actually doing? Are they actually helping or facilitating symbiosis? So this particular microRNA that we were looking at, um, we call it MIR8, we decided to really mess with it and try and get rid of it from the fungus. So this is a normal wild type fungus. Um, so the yellow is the fungus down here. You have a eucalyptus grandis root growing. Um, and these fat yellowish roots are roots that have been colonized by Pyzolethus. So normally roots would be long, thin, and white. But when um, an ectomycorrhizal fungus colonizes a root, it stops it from growing and forms these beautiful short little fat things, okay? However, if um, the root no longer recognizes Pyzolethus as a beneficial symbiotic fungus, it will try and escape it, which means the root will try and grow. So what we did was we manipulated the fungus, we knocked 
down um, the fungus's ability to produce um, this microRNA8. And what we got was, yes, we still had fungus, and we still had it starting to colonize the root. But then what you can see here is that the root is able to break away from the fungus and keep growing. So what this indicates to us is that when this microRNA8 is present, the fungus is able to colonize the plant very well. When it is absent, the root is just like, no, nah, I have, don't want anything to do with you. And the reason it does this is because this microRNA8, remember what I said, microRNAs, their whole purpose is to stop protein production of a specific protein. What they actually do is they target a family of proteins that is involved or key within plants uh, immune system, and they degrade um, and stop the production of those proteins. Therefore, what this is saying is these microRNAs are um, inhibiting the plant immune system to be able to do this. So the conclusion from this first part is the fact that microRNAs are actually keys that are being used by hyphae or by fungi um, to disarm plant defenses, to be able to take over and grow into those roots, okay? Now I said that was the first key that I wanted to look at. The second key was protein. So could proteins be also keys used by these ectomycorrhizal fungi to manipulate um, their hosts? to be able to actually grow into the roots uh, itself. So I'll go back to this again, central dogma, right? You have the DNA producing, RNA producing protein, which I said is a fully valid um, pathway. Now, again, within humans and other, and other organisms, usually we think of that protein staying put inside a cell, doing something useful, like detoxifying something, producing something like energy um, and keeping the organism alive. However, you also have a subcategory of proteins that have a very specific um, sequence within them that tells the cell they, are, they have no purpose in the cell and that they should be exported outside. So what they do is they're loaded into this um, structure within a cell that's called a Golgi apparatus. And that Golgi apparatus packages everything up into a nice little bundle and it ships it outside. So it's kind of like taking out the garbage, except this garbage is actually useful. So this is called the secretion pathway within the cell. So remember, some proteins stay inside the cell, but the, but the proteins we're interested in that might be doing something with negotiating with a, or taking over a host are going to be secreted outside the fungal hyphae. Now, there is precedent outside of, of fungi um, for proteins that are secreted outside of an organism that then manipulate um, plant cells and plant immunity. So there's bacteria, nematodes, aphids, seeds that all produce secreted proteins that get outside of the, the organism and get inside the plant cell. And they do a lot of different things, but the main thing usually is that they are altering plant immune systems. Okay, so they're really, really rather um, nasty little um, pieces of protein, but they actually have a very cool um, function. So these type of proteins are usually called effectors. They have a lot of different um, parts of their definition. They're secreted, as I said. Um, they're usually only produced by an organism that is um, trying to overtake a host. Um, they have to be shuttled back in, or they have to be shuttled from the fungus into the host. Um, and they usually have to target immunity within that plant. Now, Turns out that um, beneficial microbes like mycorrhizal fungi um, encode a lot of these, which would make sense because they, as I said, are quite invasive. Um, and so there are a number of them, as I've listed here, that have been published. If you're interested, you can look a little bit more into these and what they are doing. But I thought I'd give you just a little bit of a taste um, using some cartoons of, of what they may be doing. So the very first one that we looked at um, was called MISP7. So MISP7 is uh, mycorrhizal induced small secreted protein seven. Um, and it is involved in getting into out of fungal hyphae during that the beginning steps of symbiosis with a host. And it goes into the plant cell, much like that microRNA that I was just talking about. But what it does is it does not affect protein production. What it does is it affects hormone signaling. Now, just like humans have hormones, um, and hormones, as we know well, um, do a lot of stuff for us. Plants as well have a whole range of hormones that enable them to grow, um, to produce fruit, 
Um, but as well, hormones are very um, key in um, modulating how a plant is able to defend itself. So what happens um, in a typical situation is when hormones are produced, they have to be sensed by what's called a receptor. Um, so those are just more proteins within the plant cell, um, here um, indicated by boxes. What MISP7 does is it comes out of the fungal hyphae, it goes into a plant cell, and then it, what it does is it binds to the plant's hormone receptor. And it somehow changes it, what that receptor is doing so that when the plant hormone that usually induces plant immunity is produced, that hormone can no longer bind or be perceived by that receptor. Um, the genes associated with immunity are no longer produced. And that interruption of hormone um, perception allows recolonization. So again, these are really kind of interesting proteins that much like the microRNA I was talking about earlier are really manipulating how that plant cell is operating. However, we don't just have hormones um, that are involved in plant immunity. Um, we have also what are called metabolites. So metabolites are not proteins. Um, they are chemical compounds that are produced by a whole range of organisms. Um, and they can be involved in plant immunity. And usually these metabolites are toxic, um, but not always. And one class of metabolites are called polyamines. And these are, um, so these are some names of these polyamines. There's spermidine, cadaverine, putrescine. Um, their names are actually associated with where they were first discovered because they are quite odiferous uh, compounds. So spermidine, um, is what gives sperm its smell, cadaverine, a cadaver, putrescine is the smell of putrefaction. So while we associate them with a particular smell of a particular um, uh, cell or um, decomposition, they are also heavily, heavily involved in plant immunity. And so what polyamines do is they usually are, are used by plants um, to fight off disease-causing microbes. And yet, oddly, they're also a metabolite that is actually good for mycorrhizal fungi. So mycorrhizal fungi like a plant that produces a lot of polyamines, because for some reason that allows them to colonize the root. Why? We're not quite sure. However, the question here is, um, will um, fungi be able to produce something that encourages the production of these polyamines and thus supports colonization? So, Slightly scary um, path di pathway diagram here, um, but this is the metabolism in plants that produces the spermine, spermidine, and other polyamines. And the production of these polyamines, which remember allows um, ectomycorrhizal fungi to colonize plant roots, um, requires a, basically a building block, which is adenosylmethionine. And ad adenosylmethionine is a building block for a lot of other different compounds like methylation, like ethylene, which is actually a hormone within the plant. And the interesting thing is that these different pathways have different effects on mycorrhizal fungi. So if the plant decides to use that building block to make ethylene, ethylene is a stress hormone and it actually induces immunity and it stops colonization. So that's what this um, flat arrow means. On the other hand, if the plant decides when the fungus is present to use that adenosylmethionine to methylate proteins, which are just uh, functionalizing different proteins, it can either stop colonization or induce colonization. Very confusing, depends on what pathway you're looking at. However, as I said, if the plant is able to use that adenosylmethionine and shunts it into the biosynthetic pathway of these polyamines, it takes it away from these other pathways and promotes colonization again. So we were looking for quite a while and we found this effector called MISP10. Um, and what it does is, um, I have a slightly different, um, the effector actually works here. Um, and what it does is it forces the plant to use adenosylmethionine to make polyamines, which is really kind of cool because it's then increasing the flux over here, taking it away from all these other bad guys. Um, and then in, improves colonization. So going back again to our, our conclusions of, of what mycorrhizal fungi are using to manipulate their hosts. 
secreted proteins can also be used as keys to disarm the defenses or immunity within the plant. So from there, we are you know, now proceeding a little bit down and asking some alternative questions. And, and one of those is, well, OK, so if these keys are so important, what happens if we swap keys? What if we take um, a gene um, that encodes one of these secreted proteins or effector proteins from one fungus and put it into another one? Can we actually alter what plants it's able to colonize? So it's kind of like if you were to take the keys to your house and give them to a friend of yours, your friend would be able to access your house, right? Um, it's still not their house, it's still your house, but they still have access to it, okay? So what we're hoping to do, and we just got funding to do this, is to take um, genes, and this is a phylogenetic tree of, of um, some different proteins from um, two different Paisalitha species, and take a protein from a, um, a fungus that is able to colonize eucalyptus here, transfer it into a fungus that cannot and is only able to colonize pine and ask by changing keys or giving that key to that other fungus, is it now able to colonize a non-host tree? So with that, I'd just like to quickly thank um, those people who have been instrumental in the work that I've presented today, um, as well as a number of the funding agencies and if I can just take a second more, um, there are two new positions opening up in my lab. Um, if you are interested in doing a PhD um, in looking at some of the more applied aspects of mycorrhizal fungi, I've got one opening up soon in that. Um, and if you are really intrigued uh, by small secreted proteins and looking for a postdoc position, hopefully tomorrow um, an, a job in that area in my lab is going to be advertised as well. And with that, I will stop sharing and I'm happy to take any questions. Wow, that was really terrific. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Heady stuff, but um, really interesting. Um, I remember reading an article recently about <clears throat> Pisolithus and how un unpicky it was with its host. And um, <clears throat> so it was interesting that you brought that up in, in your talk because um, I guess that was what earmarked it as potentially for um, microremediation in areas that it would happily partner up with a variety of species. And that is very definitely that. Do you know of any other fungi that are also particularly unfussy that are on your radar or is it just Pisolithus? Uh, there are a number of them. Um, so, and I, I guess it depends with, with Pisolithus, it depends on the species, right? I mean, there's a Pisolithus tinctorius um, that only really colonizes pine and a few other gymnosperms. Um, the Pisolithus species, however, that are here in Australia, you're right, they're relatively unpicky, but that's because they've evolved here and they've evolved with the different flora and fauna that we have. Um, there's another mycorrhizal fungus called Lucaria. Um, it's another lab rat that we use quite frequently. Um, it colonizes a whole range of hosts. Um, you can find Lucaria here, you can find it all throughout you know, North America, Europe, et cetera. Um, and it's being investigated more molecularly for understanding symbiosis, but a little bit in, in phytoremediation. Um, Suillus is another one that within gymnosperms is relatively, um, has a broad spectrum of hosts. Um, and a lot of people, especially in North America, are looking at using that um, as, a, as a means of partnering up with pine trees. Um, different pine species to be able to plant those pine into super sites, which are sites that are really heavy metal, um, uh, have a high levels of heavy metals. Um, so yeah, I know there's a number of them that are being used in that way. Very good. We certainly see a lot of lacaria here. Um, incidentally, they seem to be, uh, a, some species are post-fire um, occurrences, but um, lacaria. And but Swillis, yes, more in with the gymnosperms, the exotic pines that have brought in. So we do have a couple of questions um, and feel free to uh, unmute everyone if you want to ask the question yourself. And so I have Vanessa Ryan asking, would pathogenic fungi use similar methods to gain access to plants? Yeah, great question. Um, and I'm sad to say that, well, I'm not sad to say, so yes, they do. Um, so that's actually where they were first found. So because pathogens obviously are, um, something that we are really trying to control. Um, that's where a lot of the first research in this area went um, because it was found that um, uh, pathogenic fungi are using these um, as keys to, to unlock 
um, and take over their plant hosts. I talked about it from a, a mutualistic perspective. So in this case, these are um, proteins, RNA, et cetera, that are, are keeping the plant alive, keeping the plant healthy, um, turning off the immune system. Um, and depending on the type of pathogen you're looking at, some of them obviously need to kill their host so they can feed off of it, so necrotrophs. Um, and so they actually use some of these proteins to actually toxify or kill off their host or to actually induce immune responses so that the plant is actually trying to kill off its own tissue, um, which is benefiting um, those pathogenic fungi. Wow, so it's inducing an autoimmune response. Mm, totally. Wow, fantastic. Eric is asking, from your knowledge and gen genetic branches, which, which is older, ectomycorrhizal fungi or endomycorrhizal? So um, I guess for the introductory people, um, we have, the, I might just give them a little 101 or you're welcome to, ecto endomycorrhizal and arbuscular. So ectomycorrhizal sit on the outside of roots, endomycorrhizal penetrate the roots and yep. arbuscular, arbuscular mycorrhizal penetrate the cells is that right so it's yeah. three levels of so so um our vascular would be a type of endomycorrhizal um yes, but a bit more intense yep version yeah. of endo i think we yeah we did we had ecto and endo and then our vascular i think our vascular have what 12 different levels of degrees of penetration of the cells i'm not yeah. sure i'm not i'm not familiar with the different um, levels of them. I just think of them a bit more generally. Um, but yeah. So Eric, getting to your question, endomycorrhizal fungi are the oldest by far. Um, so our muscular mycorrhizal fungi are thought to be the main um, symbiotic fungus that enabled plants to actually colonize land. Um, so they would have been there right when plants were crawling out of the oceans. Ectomycorrhizal fungi don't really actually appear um, on the scene until gymnosperm trees were evolving. Um, so that would be, oh gosh, I think that's about 400 million years ago. So ectomycorrhizal fungi are actually uh, relatively new to the scene um, in that case. Well, I guess if I was applying logic, I, I would have thought the opposite to be true. Um, and further to that, he, he says, still learning about ectomycorrhizal ECM. Can you please elaborate on heartic nets on cellular on a cellular level, same as the rest of fungi or different to ones close to the plant cells? Okay, so I'm not sure I understand um, the question, Eric. Um, do you mind elaborating just a little bit more? Eric, are you able to unmute? Oh, Eric can't. Okay, unmute. right, He's he can't unmute. From the screen. I'll um, unmute it now. Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, like, um, is there a difference between, I guess, the what makes up the the heart neck? So, like, what is what is the actual heart neck? Uh, heart net, sorry. Um, and like, what sort of cells are, are they made up of? And would the ones sort of outside, um, be different to like the ones that are sort of making contact with the plant cell? Like, like, the, like with your the screen that you sort of, um, or the picture that you showed with the ones that are just making contact with the well, like, just to receive and um, distribute the. Yeah, nutrients. Nutrients. Yeah. Yeah. No, good question. So, don't know. <laughs> oh, quick okay. answer. Um, so, typically, yes. Yeah. So, the the hyphae that make up the mantle and the heart again are the same in the fact that they have the same genetic material. However, they have different roles so even though they're it's both both of them are made up of hyphae just like you would see in a in a in a, in a fruiting body um different genetic um programs are induced in the mantle versus in the heart again so in the mantle usually more you'll get um production of um, storage compounds. So the fungus, when it's taking the carbon away from, from the plant, ex it accepts it as a really simple sugar, but then it actually makes it up into a really complex sugar that gets stored um, for a rainy day. So it's food for a rainy day, essentially. That goes into the mantle. It doesn't stay in the harding net. The mantle also usually is where you'll find things like um, toxins. So one of the key roles of ectomycorrhizal fungi is they actually protect roots from grazing from things like springtails and, and other things like that in the soil. And that's because within that mantle, um, a lot of different toxic compounds also get produced. Versus in the harding net, um, even though it's still hyphae of the same organism, um, because of its position within the root and how this happens, we're not sure. Um, 
it is acting more along the lines of it's trying to just exchange nutrients with the plant, uh, produce these proteins and microRNAs that I've been talking about. So it directly feeds it to those, to those root cells as close as possible. So same cells or same types of cells, just different roles. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, I think That's you amazing. had a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, maybe do Vanessa's first. Okay, sure. Um, Vanessa had a question she's typed in. What do you hope to achieve in the end with your research? Are you wanting to create more species of fungi that can assist agricultural or forestry plants? Yeah. So that would involve using genetically modified organisms. And when it comes to microbes and genetic modification, people get a little bit scared, which I fully understand. Um, so while I use genetic modification within the lab, um, releasing those is not the aim. Um, the aim in this case is, and this is one thing I didn't get into at all today, um, is even though like you'll go out on a fungal foray and you'll see mushrooms of the same species or of the same genus. And you can easily think, because it's been thought for a lo long time, oh, I'm seeing pisolites, I'm seeing lucaria. You know, in different parts of the forest, they're doing the same thing, they're helping these trees. It turns out though, um, that just like humans, um, different fungi, just because of small mutations and because of um, the fact that they undergo sexual reproduction, um, every individual that you see within the forest, not every, but a number of them, um, will have different characteristics. And so what we're trying to do with, with my research is trying to actually understand um, if I take a mushroom and grow that fungus um, from Northern Queensland, as opposed to Tasmania, they might benefit a plant differently. Hopefully um, this is making sense. So just like humans, some of us um, turn into criminals, some of us don't turn into criminals. Um, even within beneficial fungi like this, you have a whole gamut of different genetic bases that enable them to be more or less beneficial to, plant, to trees. So the end goal of what we're doing is to try and figure out what is the genetic blueprint of um, a fungus that makes it the most beneficial to trees. Because if we could identify that, what we can do is we can go out into forests and harvest hundreds and hundreds of different individuals of the same species of this fungus, identify which ones are actually going to really benefit trees. Um, and then we can go to foresters um, and say, when you're growing your seedlings that are gonna go out for reforestation, please use these. Um, because then they can in intentionally inoculate them onto the roots of those trees, they go into the forest, and then you begin getting um, trees that regenerate faster, establish faster, you know, or like going back to the earlier question that, that Wayne had about, you know, can they um, remediate areas by sequestering um, heavy metals? That's another thing, you know, if we can identify what enables some of these fungi to, to enable a plant to colonize like mine tailings or the things like that, um, that enables us to, to intentionally inoculate these trees that are going out. So that's more the aim of the research there um, from, from what we do. Very good. And a thanks from Vanessa. Tammy, did you have a question? Yeah, no, I don't have a science background, so apologies if this is a, a basic question. Um, you, you spoke about one type of ectomycorrhizal fungi being um, or, or enhancing another one that's already um, with a host host species. Do ectomycorrhizal fungi compete against each other typically? And therefore they can also compete with parasitic or pathogenic. So, so if you wanted to eliminate a particular type of fungi, then ectomycorrhizal might be a method to do that. Totally, yes. Um, it's all at war down there, honestly. <laughs> um, so yeah, it is not a naive question at all. And it is something that we're really only beginning to even question. So you should have been here a while ago um, because it's a really good question from the perspective of, um, you know, the, a lot of the work I do is one fungus, one plant, really easy. I'm a simple person. Out in nature, obviously there's hundreds of different fungi that are competing for this same real estate of a root. Um, so I'll start first off with your question, can ectomycorrhizal fungi compete with each other? Yes, they definitely can. Um, can, who wins? 
is a is a different question altogether. Probably um, what goes on because any tree that we look at, even pines, which have a relatively restricted number of mycorrhizal fungi that they host, um, you'll find different mycorrhizal species on different parts of the roots, um, and that's and that zonation is probably because of competition between each other. Um, but the plant allowing all of them is, we assume, because all of them bring a slightly different benefit to the plant. Okay, so hopefully that answers the first part of your question. Um, the second part of the question of can they be used to outcompete pathogens? Definitely. Um, so this is one thing that PhD position actually that I was just talking about. This is what we're looking at because pine production and eucalyptus production as well in nurseries, um, often um, if they don't inoculate with a beneficial fungus intentionally, um, it's just they're using sterile potting mix. And so anything can come in. And if a pathogen arrives, it's like fair day for them. They're like, woohoo, we have a plant, nobody competing, and it kills it. Um, so what foresters are doing more and more now is trying to put in as many beneficials as they can, um, basically to take up space um, and to try and, and take up space that these pathogens can't come in. But also because um, these ectomycorrhizal fungi are manipulating the host, they're actually also able, what I also didn't cover, to induce certain types of immunity within the tree that benefit the mycorrhizal fungus. It can colonize still, even if that immunity is there, but pathogens can't. Thank you. Thank you. Penelope is um, asking, you mentioned that the fungus knows when it's nearby to the plant root. How did you discover that? What do the fungi do to show this? Any elaboration would be great. Thanks for your research and talk, terrific stuff. So the way that we find out that that happens is a lot of really painful work. <laughs> um, so um, I showed you the picture there. Um, so if you're familiar with Petri dishes, these are you know small little dishes about that big. Um, and we use a number of different ways of separating, physically separating the fungus and the plant root. But all of these separations that we use have little pores in them. Um, and so that enables, if there is protein exchange or nutrient exchange or whatever, enables that to happen. And so the way we know that the fungus starts to act differently when the, when the root is there is um, it will grow differently. Um, so it will start to get actually thicker. So it's really cool that if, um, you were to look um, in a lot of cases at um, one of these dishes where I have the roots of the plant growing and then there's that kind of membrane and then the fungus on top. Sometimes, especially with some of the fungi that are a bit thinner, it actually, you can actually begin to see the whole outline of the root system because right over top of the root, that fungus starts building up thicker, thicker fungus. But where there isn't a root, it won't, it stays very thin. So that's one way, it actually starts physically looking different. Um, the other way we know that is because when the two are, are close together, you can actually take the hyphae and begin looking at expression of genes or look at what proteins are produced or what chemicals are produced. And again, it changes drastically when a root is present versus when it's not. So that kind of gives us an idea that they don't actually even have to physically touch, um, but there's some kind of communication going on between them. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, question from Richard. In your end slide, um, could you elaborate a little bit about how you're training one of your strains to go on another host strain, whether that's genetically or can it be possible to be trained over time? So if we were to train it over time, and I'll put train in, in quotations there, yeah. that would involve <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of evolution. So probably... Um, between species, it would take millennia. Um, in that case, it would just be living beside or in the in the presence of of that alternative tree that isn't a host. And over time, you would think that there would be small mutations um, within that fungus as it slowly, slowly grows because they are able to grow without a host, but not well. Um, and it would hope at some point be able to take over that root and grow into it. Um, we don't have millennia. <laughs> we have a three-year time window. Um, so what we do is we just do genetic modified organisms. So we actually um, clone out a gene. Um, so that's copy out the gene and actually use, um, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with genetic modification, but we actually use bacteria to reintroduce 
that gene into another fungal species um, and it inserts it into the genome and then that fungus just begins making the protein that that, that gene encodes. Um, and then we just take that modified organism, put it onto a tree um, in our um, PC2 facilities uh, and then see if it colonizes. Yeah, wow, awesome. Thank you. Rose, are the fungi uh, you are working with here in Australia, Australian fungi or where do they come from? The majority of them are Australian. So Pisolithus itself um, is thought to have evolved within Australasia. Um, so we have the highest concentration of species here um, and in some of the surrounding countries. Um, but we do have a collection from all over the world because we're trying to understand more globally um, how similar and how different they are. Thank you, Eric. A little bit up, further up, which is how do you foray uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi? Um, just knowing what you're looking for in that case. Um, so uh, um, a lot of the, the city of my seats have really nice big uh, mushrooms. So like Pisolithus, big puffball, um, Suillus and others quite large. Um, the, usually that's how we go about it. Um, and then grab uh, a, a piece of them and we grow them on a selective media in the lab and then we just keep them. Um, you can grow them again and again. Um, on the other case, um, we are also going and digging up roots and looking for those, because remember I said um, mycorrhizal roots are short and fat rather than long and thin. Um, so again, we just go out and we dig up um, roots of pine trees, of eucalypt trees, et cetera, et cetera, and then sit under a microscope and pull off these tiny roots, sterilize the outside, because remember there's hyphae inside that are active, um, and again, put them onto a nutrient media in a petri dish, um, and if you're lucky, it will grow out, and then you've got a pure culture of, of the mycorrhizal fungi. Great stuff, thank you. One more question for me as well. Um, yeah, tell me. Is it possible for one fungi to be ectomycorrhizal and beneficial to one host, but you introduce it to another host and it becomes pathogenic? Not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's any recorded ones of ectos being pathogenic. However, within our own research, we know that um, depending on the isolate that we get, um, and when I mean isolate, it's a, a specific genetic individual that is different from another. Um, depending on the tree species we're working with, it will be beneficial on one and it will be parasitic on another one. And when I say parasitic, it doesn't kill the tree, but it's taking all the carbon photosynthate it can get its, its um, hyphae on without giving any actual nutrient benefit to the host. So then it's acting as a drain. So parasitic, definitely there are lots of examples out there of that, um, but pathogenic, I'm not familiar with any. Interesting. I was just getting my head around the changing roles of fungi. And um, I understand that, I guess a fungus can change its relationship with its host, but it really de depends on the nature of the host, whether it's symbiotic or dying or dead um, and then you can see a changing relationship or a changing role um, you can yep. see a mycorrhizal become or endophytic become mycorrhizal become endophytic and and then if the host dies then it'll change it becomes saprobic and break it down so but yeah. um, it's interesting to hear that the same fungus could have a, a different a different relationship with the different species Mm, definitely. Or like you say, even abiotic conditions, like if you start fertilizing, um, in that case, the plant begins trying to get rid of its mycorrhizal fungi as well. So um, there's I guess a lot you're superseding the role of the fungus in that situation. Mm, yeah, because then the plant is like, why do I want to, you know, try and feed you when I can just get everything I want for free? <laughs> Very good. Are there any further questions? Yeah. I think everyone's kind of blown away. This is really cutting edge stuff <laughs> and very exciting. One other question, and I will digress here just a little bit. So is the research you're doing leading into assisting with or expanding the knowledge we have around genetic modification? Um, was it really just understanding 
how to better deploy fungi? Yeah, so yeah, so not, no, I'm not really working in the area of trying to advance how we do genetic modification. It's just using it as a tool, okay. um, a tool of understanding and a tool of trying to advance, you know, where we should look next um, right. and how we should capitalize from these fungi. And I don't want to digress too much, but I noticed with in the plant when the RNA marker was deployed and you created that faux virus by creating a double strand of RNA within the plant cell. Yep. Mm -hmm. How does the plant recognize and defeat the virus? Is it similar to the CRISPR technology we deployed or recognized from streptococcus single-celled organisms? Or do plants fight off viruses in a different way? I know that's probably a sideways thing. I'm not sure. Okay. Good question. Um, so to destruct, to recognize um, the double-stranded RNA, they're using an argonaut dicer system. Um, so it's just these proteins that are floating around and it recognizes, you know, if there's a, a single versus double-stranded conformation. Um, and then that double-stranded gets brought and loaded into these proteins. And then these proteins, dicer as its name would say, just chop it up into, into bits and pieces. Okay. Um, I think that's different from how CRISPR is working. So. Yes. Yes. Okay. I thought it might be different for plants, but I wasn't sure. And I thought if there's anyone to ask, it would be you now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that really informative talk. And um, that was very exciting. I appreciate it. So. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, everyone. I'll, um, I'll stop recording in a moment when I can get back to my computer. It's a little, little technically complex here, but um, and yes, thank you from everyone. And I think there'll be many thanks afterwards for the people who weren't able to make it tonight. Um, we had a lot of people emailing saying, I can't make it. Can you, can you record it? Can you record it? So thank you for allowing us to. That was, that's very valuable. Not a problem. Thank you, Jonathan. And um, good luck with your research. Thank you very much.